Championship Wrestling. Bringing you great wrestling action. Sanctioned by the NWA, National Wrestling Alliance. And overall, a very good main event. So, thumbs up to this Ring of Honor show, I thought. I would say thumbs up for the main event. Then we watched NWA World Championship Wrestling, April 12th, 1986. Show opened with a clip of the horseman jumping Ron Garvin and laying him out. These horsemen just keep fucking Ronnie Garvin. They do. It seems like they're building up for something. <laughs> oh, the, the, dude, the Garvin build is nothing compared to some other stuff. What are you talking about? We're looking. We're 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 working on a three year build right here. I feel like are we working on? Or is your build to the end of the company? It might be because that is a long term build. <laughs> that is a long term build. They announced David Crockett was not there. Oh, my Actually, God. this show opened with maybe... For, it wasn't 20 minutes, but there was a lot of talking in the opening, opening this show. They announced David Crockett is not there. Tony Schiavone starts talking about the Russians, the six-man champions. He's going on and on about getting them to defend the title. And says, tonight, those titles will finally be on the line. Against the team, I'm thinking, Magnum and the Road Warriors or something. No. Nelson Royal, the Italian Stallion, and as I wrote here at the time, somebody else. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Well, you know, Vinny, on a show where you're going to give the fans Ric Flair versus Ricky Morton. Well, that's true. Not every match is going to be a main event. But at the time, this was. <laughs> then Dusty comes out and cuts a promo. Baby Doll's the hottest woman in wrestling. I'm the biggest draw in the sport. Let, let's leaves. compare our notes here. Let's compare what you wrote Dusty is saying, and then I'll write what I thought that he said. Okay, what I said... This was a rambling Dusty Rhodes... That's what I got out of it. Uh, exactly what I wrote. He cut a promo, running down the horseman, claimed Baby Doll was the hottest woman in wrestling, and that he was the biggest draw in the sport. Okay, I got... Dusty rambles about this and that, and says nobody is hotter than Baby Doll. Something about Raging Bull, and how this show is live and in person... And he's a tower of power. Yeah, so you got more details? <laughs> That's what I, I got. I want more of a big picture view. I thought that was a big picture view when I wrote it. I guess. So he leaves, and Tony starts talking about the Russians more. I what? was so sad. On and on about Nikita. David Crockett was not here tonight. I was sad at the beginning of the show when he wasn't there. I was really sad later in the show when he wasn't there. Yeah. Oh, I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. Oh, you're right. Can you imagine David Crockett in that Ricky Morton Ric Flair match? He'd have lit on fire. We played on this show the audio of when Ricky Morton slapped Ric Flair and they got in the big brawl and they got in the ring and all that happened was Ricky Morton sent him packing. Yeah. Imagine if David Crockett was there and Ricky Morton was bouncing him around like a pinball for 25 minutes. Even though it wasn't 25 minutes. Sure, it goddamn seemed like it. I don't think David could have... I don't think he could have survived it. No. I think that's why he had to leave. <laughs> For his own safety. I think he took himself off the show. He just thought, there's no way my heart can take Ric Flair versus Ricky Morton here on this show. I'm going to go to Baltimore or wherever he went. So the opening match was George South and Tony Zane against the team of Rage and Bull and... I'm going to try to pronounce this man's name the way it was spelled on the graphic... Hector Guerrero. <laughs> Guerrero? There's a, several extra R's in there. Wow. Yeah. Hector looked exactly like Eddie Guerrero. He, he looked exactly like my father in the 70s. Yes. He had appalling generic mariachi music. Once the match started, these dudes were working. Oh, the bull was raging. The bull was raging. Hector was on fire. The jobbers were forced to keep up with him. And the only time it ever slowed down at all was when Rage and Bull, out of mercy, would allow them to make a tag and slow things down. And then go right back at, right, right back into fire mode. So the finish, Bull hits a back elbow. He tags out, and then he squats down on the apron. And Hector stands on his shoulders. Bull squats him up, and Hector hits a huge diving flying crossbody for the win. That finish ruled. That was a very fun TV squash match. During the match, they announced... Two big things. Number one, the Jim Crockett Senior Memorial Cup is next week, and $1 million is on the line. Also, Shaska Watley is in the building tonight, along with 
the ball bearing. <laughs> it's always important. What more could I ask for than number one, Paul Jones, the ball bearing, and now Shaska Watley, which, by the way, ended up being the main event. It did. Because what else? What else could be the main event on this show? Nothing. No. So Hector and Bull immediately cut a promo. They were both still huffing and puffing. The gimmick both guys have was to speak in English for a while and then speak in Spanish. And this did not get over in Atlanta. It may have gotten over in San Antonio, which they referenced several times. Yeah, but you know what? They didn't. They were they were tolerant. They were tolerant. They it wasn't like they were screaming speak English. No, they weren't booing or. They weren't throwing American flags. There were no the... flag waving, no USA chants, no racial slurs. Those would come later. Hector thanked the beautiful people of this great land for accepting him, which was a good way to start. And he spoke in Spanish for a while. Bull did the same gimmick, and uh, he noted that when he spoke in Spanish, it was not getting over, and finally he spoke in English again and said, hey, I'm a veteran for this country. And everyone said, yeah! So that worked. The Latin connection is what they're being called. Latin connection. Felt like I was watching Galavision. It was a great team, actually. Yeah. In hindsight, I'd be fine with Rage and Bull and Hector Guerrero every week. I'd be happy with them today. Yeah. Yes. Better than The Miz and Zack Ryder. Yes. Or The Hype Bros. God, yes. Black Bart versus Gene Ligon. Bart Ligon? is the Mid-Atlantic champion. I've given up even keeping track of who has what belt anymore. He is the champion of the entire Mid-Atlantic area. The Carolinas, Virginia, Georgia, I guess. And even Tony made some sort of comment about hard to get used to Black Bart with a championship belt around his waist <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> and then they announced the former champion, Sam Houston, is going to be wrestling later against... Arn Anderson. Yeah. I can't wait. So this is short. Gene Ligon can sell better than almost anyone on this roster or any other. Bart worked his arm over for a minute or two with arm ringers, and then we made his comeback. Gene was throwing punches with his right arm while his left arm hung limp at his side. Didn't work. Bart cut him off, hit a body slam, and a middle rope leg drop for the win. Black Bart, the original Hanson. The, the, the prototype Hanson. Sure. The current Hanson is vastly improved, but I see where you're going. Absolutely. Well, the top rope leg drop. Yeah. They both had that big move. Well, there's a visual similarity, too. Yeah, basically. Hanson is a greatly improved Black Bart. Greatly improved. Tully Blanchard did a promo. Tully is so great. Mm -hmm. I went to WrestleCon, and Tully was there, and I just... I didn't want to just go up to everybody and... Just talked to everybody. I just looked at him. Well, that's not creepy. I didn't even no. I mean, I didn't even go say hi or anything. I didn't even introduce myself for nothing. I just I didn't say hi to anybody there except Lance, and I tried to find Missy. Yeah. So Tully was great here. He said, "My point is, I regret that. I see. I would have liked to have gone up to him and said, Tully, you were so fucking great. I know you're a man of the Lord now, but you were fucking great. You know that." He'd probably say, fucking A right I was. So, he explained, you know, Ron Garvin, got to admire his toughness. He's got an injured hand. Might be broken, might not be. But I tell you what, either way, in wrestling, you are not allowed to tape up your fist and turn it into, into a weapon. Finally. Somebody brings this up. Yes. He, even, he even said, it's like he's listening to our show. He goes, a closed fist is illegal. Yes. Why is this guy allowed to do this move? And Tony had no answer. No. I have no answer. He said, look. The it, NWA had no answer. Garvin, if your wrist is broken, then go get a cast put on it. You can still wrestle with a cast on and support your family. Or families. <laughs> then he moved on. That was a good one. <laughs> that was so awesome. Otherwise, leave that hand untaped so you can wrestle fair and square. He said, you're like Dusty. Dusty had a foot injury and got an illegal boot. I won't be surprised to see you in the ring with an Ill illegal glove someday. And doesn't matter, because for all you try and pull, Ric Flair and myself and Arn, Arn, and Arn Anderson were champions. You and Dusty, you got nothing. Can't argue with that. Tully was so awesome. Can't argue with that. Just sitting there with his sunglasses. He's all blinged out. He's got his belt. Like, he, this, is, this is the man. He was a pro. Ivan 
Ivan Koloff and Nikita Koloff and Baron Von Raschke versus Italian Stallion and Nestle, Nelson Royal and Denny Brown. For the World Six Man title. World Six Man titles. Vinny, I don't give a shit what you think about the Young Bucks and Kenny Omega and Baron Von Raschke and anybody else. If you don't admit that this match was fucking great, you're fired. Oh, no, I, no, I'm right there with you. This match was great. I thought this was going to be a joke of a match. And uh, instead, the Russians wrestled this, like, constantly. Like these men were great wrestlers and a threat to their championships. Let me talk about all that was great about this match. Then you may proceed. First off, the heat was great. Because it is man versus Russian. Which in 1986 is just instant heat. Nelson Royal, at one point, goes to give the hot tag to the Italian stallion. Gives him the lightest hot tag you ever saw. Oh, yes. <laughs> I was like, this. can I have a match with Nelson Royal? This man's great. They went back and forth. All action, quick tags. They never stopped. Came across like six dudes fighting for supremacy. Frantically. Not like a patterned... Like, you see these tag matches today or these six-mans, and we've seen the six-man on Raw a million times. You know exactly how it works. You get the heat on the baby face forever. He makes a hot tag. You get the heat on that guy forever. He gets a second hot tag. That guy runs wild. You do all the near falls. Listen, I'm not even complaining. I think these six-mans nowadays are awesome. But this was totally different, and it was great. Tag, 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 tag. Finally, Stallion runs wild, and... The finish is, as Stallion is Before, running wild... May I interrupt you here? One of the great things about this match... While this was, better be a good interruption. While it's all back and forth, the one thing they did was they protected Nikita. He was not in the match very much. As they explained, it was his first TV match in months. He was not in the vat match very much. When he was in, he was almost always on offense. And when he was taking moves, he would do the... Uh, you know, he, he would react, but he would not sell, and he was never taken off his feet. With that, the finish. Stallion runs wild and gets larrieded. Well, yeah. <laughs> you took all the steam off of me. Hey, God gets he it, ran runs wild, wild and he ran Nikita wild. just ran him over. He took Ivan down. He took Baron down. When he got to Nikita, he dropped kicking him back, and Nikita went back to the corner, which is the biggest beating Nikita took in the whole match. But then out of the corner, he came out with a clothesline and killed him. So it was highly entertaining to watch. It made everyone involved look like a star, and it made Nikita look like a fucking killer. No, this is great. This was tremendous. Shivani interviews Garvin. Ah. Garvin called the heels who had injured his hand terrorists. Yes, he said it was a terroristic act. It was an act of terror. He talked about having to drive his truck with his bad hand because he's a working man. So I've, had, I've been working with his bad hand. I don't know if it's broken or not. Well, go get a check, dude. Dude. That's important. He's driving a truck. He's not the champ. He doesn't make a half million a year. He's out there. He's a working man. He doesn't have time to go to the hospital. He's got to drive his goddamn truck and wrestle. Like a real working man, Vinny. Men don't go to the goddamn hospital. They don't take time off. They're not pussies. So he was threatening that the horseman's day would come and he had to watch their back anywhere. Might be in the ring, out of the ring. Maybe even in the shower. Lord, I hope not. I don't want to see that skit. And then they showed the angle. They had showed it a, a little bit at the beginning of the show where uh, the horseman jumped Garvin. Here they showed the whole thing. The horseman jumped Garvin, and then the key is they stretched his hand across the ring post and started whacking it with a cowboy boot. Ow. So Garvin ran his mouth for a while, and I got bored. And the other thing I want to mention here is that Garvin had a baseball hat on, only it was sitting above his head like it was too small to fit on his head, but it was way too big for him. Well, you don't want to mess up his hair. I'm not sure how this worked. It's very strange. I'm sure it was a hat from his trucking company. Getting that plug in right there. Might have been. Actually, it might have been. Do you actually have a trucking company? You talked about driving a truck. Yeah, I presume it was a gimmick, but yeah. you wear the trucking company hat. I see. It's part of the gimmick. Because you want people to think this is real. Yeah. The Road Warriors came out for a promo. Paul Ellering and the Road Warriors here. Hawk is very mad because of something the Russians had done. And so, normally, Hawk comes out and he does wacky promos. But not today. Hawk felt like he was going to blow up. The last stinking straw. I watched him turn red before my eyes. The <laughs> Road Warriors are hot. 
Yeah. Them stinking Russians, he said, he said repeatedly. Uh, he was very upset about what happened in Baltimore. I was a little confused because the angle they showed had been in Baltimore, and the revenge match would also be in Baltimore. There was a lot of stuff happening in Baltimore. Yes. Back in the day. So here's what happened. They showed the clips of this. And this made my heart melt. It was going to be a six man. The Russians, Ivan and Nikita and the Baron, against the Road Warriors and their manager, Paul Ellering. But Hawk couldn't make it, they said, because he'd been injured the night before. Injured at the bar, I'm sure. Probably. So Animal and Paul wrestled the Russians. I wrote two on one. It was actually two on three. So they're already down a man. And one of the men they do have is their manager. With that said, do you know how the Russians won? Cheating. Cheating. Of course. Even though they were up really one and a half men, they still had to use a chain to win to pin the manager. <laughs> yeah. Heels used to be heels, goddammit. You can then, never cheat enough. And then Ellering is talking about this, this horrible beating that he took, and he said, I had to go to the hospital where they stuck pins in my feet. Yes. What? <laughs> I assume he meant acupuncture. He went about- to the hospital, <laughs> and they performed acupuncture <laughs> after he been hit with a chain? I guess this is why Ronnie Garvin didn't bother going. <laughs> to the wrong goddamn hospital. Yeah, no wonder Ronnie didn't go. I don't want people sticking these goddamn pins in my hand. So what they- are you even talking about? I thought I'd heard wrong, but I hadn't. No, that's what he said. He said they took me to the hospital and they stuck pins in my feet. He said he lost feeling in his legs. I guess that's how they test for feeling in your legs. They poke poke pins in your feet. Lost feeling. (laughs) So they're going to test by poking you with pins? Why why don't they just touch your leg? I don't know. God damn it. Where's Rachel Ellering's number? I'm going to call her and get her dad on the phone. Tell me about the time your dad was hospitalized. They put pins in his fucking feet. So they're screaming about the Russians. They're screaming about... Baltimore and revenge and all this and and also we have a match tomorrow night against the Midnight Express in Atlanta. We're going to win the tag titles. Multitasking. Wahoo this Ma- was one of those rare times where the actual wrestlers talked to rings around their manager. Yeah. Normally the managers are the good talkers. That's what the manager's there for. These guys were just on fire and then Ellering's just talking about pins in his goddamn feet. Yeah. It was a great promo. I was I was watching this and thinking about the promos we've been watching on Raw ten years later, and Hawks talking talk about sweat socks and stuff. I thought, man, oh god, the the promo Hawk did like last week. He was talking about bullshit. Yeah, things change. Well, usually the Road Warriors weren't mad because they just went into the ring and slaughtered some jobbers. That's true. This was a rare incident where they they had trouble had happened, and so they needed some revenge. Wahoo McDaniel versus Ron Rossi. Tony this... made sure to throw in a plug for David Crockett by noting that Wahoo was the master of the chop. Of the chop. So. He did not disappoint. No, he chopped the guy. He chopped him <laughs> repeatedly. I like, there was one fan here who apparently didn't want to see anything but brawling on the floor. Throw him out of the ring. Throw him out of the ring, Chief. Finally, Wahoo... Such great respect for Wahoo. And finally, well, it was. Call him Chief. So Wahoo threw the guy on the floor, and you could hear the fan go, Yay! And then Wahoo just stayed in the ring, and there was a pause, and the same fan, Now go get him! <laughs> His fan needed to be a manager. Yeah. Let me so, talk about the finish here. Yes, please do. Wahoo, <laughs> after beating up Ron Rossi, who was just as revolting a human as you can see on this particular night. Wahoo throws him into the ropes and is a tribute to the missing David Crockett. He does, in fact, chop the man. And then, when the man falls down, he drops an elbow on his face and then puts his knee on his neck and pins him. This Wahoo, do not mess with Wahoo. Well, no, that's a that's a given. I've never seen an elbow drop like this. <laughs> he dropped his I'm elbow sure on a long his time. face. Imagine everyone, like usually when you see a guy do an elbow drop, like his tricep is landing across the guy's chest, elbow, st- uh, elbow, Wahoo stood over the guy, he lifted his arm in the air, and he dropped as fast as he could go the point of his elbow into the man's forehead. Ow! I don't know what this guy did, but don't do it again. So maybe the last we ever see of Ron Ross. It might be. I I, I'd retire. Magnum TA cut a promo. Talked about all the demands the Kremlin was making. 
concerning the upcoming chain match with Nikita. This is where, granted, I realize the Ronnie Garvin flair thing is going to go for a long time. Now you know where that goddamn Berlin Wall fell. 1986, and all the Kremlin can think about is this fucking (laughs) championship, this Magnum's belt. I feel like I have been watching Magnum and Nikita cut promos in each other for the entire length of the Cold War, and there's still no payoff in sight. Dude. Flair and Garvin are a year and a half away from their goddamn At least I know that's a year and a half. I guess I know that Magnum and Nikita do have a payoff before then, but... And Magnum's not around much longer. No. But at least... Garvin and Flair will talk about other stuff. Flair will address Dusty or Ricky Morton. This is so much better than AJ Styles and Chris Jericho having four matches and a run as a tag team. In the course of two months. Word. You win. Jimmy Garvin versus Rocky Grenoodal. <laughs> the fan was the highlight of this match. The fan yelling, he's going to get you, Garvin. He's talking about Wahoo. He's coming after you, Garvin. Dude, if Garvin hadn't been getting ready for this match, if he would have been watching the Wahoo match, he'd have left the territory. Oh, yeah. I would have. I don't work with that guy. They did some fun grappling for a while. Garvin did alert the fans that he was not afraid of no Indians. Not afraid of no Indians. Once Garvin took over, it was just leg hold after leg hold. They went through a break. They came back. There was more leg holds. And then Kanoto got a little offense, but Garvin cut him off and won with a brain buster. Fans doing these stereotypical Indian war cries. Yeah. In support of the Indian. Yeah. Times change. Sadly, we know. If if Garvin's going to make one appearance on the show, he should be talking, not wrestling. Ric Flair cut a promo. <laughs> this is so amazing. A couple of weeks ago, he was talking about how he liked... He keeps talking about Ricky Morton mm-hmm. and how all of Ricky's fans are in their training bras. Mm-hmm. They're, they're training underwear. Undergarments. Undergarments, yeah. So he mentioned a couple of weeks ago that he doesn't like the little girls in their training undergarments. He wants the girls that fill out the sweaters. Yeah. So now this week, keep in mind that last week... Or a couple of weeks ago, somebody had the line about, was it, who was it? It was talking about when your your wife wakes up in some other man's bed or something like that. And they bleeped it off the show. This was too risque. Was Jimmy Valiant. Yeah, Jimmy Valiant. Too risque. Yeah. But Ric Flair this week, he decides, ah, fuck it. So he flat out says that he loves women who are double Ds. First he said, double Ds and empty heads. Yes. Full sweaters and empty heads. He pauses, and then just to clarify, double Ds, you know? And the funniest thing is... we didn't get it. He's talking about how the only thing he wants are women with giant boobs and no brains, and they keep cutting to these hot women in the crowd, and they're all so excited. Like, that's me. <laughs> hey! I, I check quali- out these tits, Rick. I qualify. Then he talks about Morton, says last week or two weeks ago, whatever it was, we had the confrontation. Morton, you stepped on one of my 150 pairs of sunglasses. I think he said $150 pair of sunglasses. I maybe he said that. So that he, was the most shocking part of the whole promo to me, that he claimed his sunglasses were only $150. Blazer was only $800. Cheap week for the flare. He's slipping. Regardless, now he said Morton was in trouble. Arn Anderson versus Sam Houston. Flare on commentary. Flare on commentary. Unbelievable. Arn was unbelievable. He gave Houston everything for several minutes. Even when Houston tried his finisher, Arn avoided it. Ar- but he, the way he avoided it ended up biting him. Houston tries the bulldog. Arn's able to push him off, but he pushes him right into the corner, and Sam just runs up the ropes and hits a body press. Finally, Arn hits the spine buster, or he next him on the ropes for the heat, and he hits the spine buster, which everyone knows is a devastating move. Except Rick, who calls it a double inverted power slam. Yes. Everyone learns something. So he's beating up this man, and then he distracts himself to talk to Ric Flair because he's a dumb heel. Only heels make this kind of mistake because wrestling made sense then. This allowed Sam to make his comeback, but Arn cut him off, and he won with a gourd buster. And he cu- Got to say that this Houston, I've been critical of Sam Houston, but he was a hell of a fiery baby face, and he took a flip bump off a shoulder tackle, which I couldn't even believe. And then later, they were doing a leapfrog spot, and he almost fell down, but he got up quick enough to still do the hip toss. And Arn never stopped running. Oh, no. Because Arn was like, you are going to get up, motherfucker. 
Because if you don't, there's going to be hell to pay. Yeah. And sure enough, he got up. Soren gets the win. He cuts his promo. He says, Houston, you missed your one shot at greatness. When you fight a man like me, I've beaten Rhodes. I've beaten Magnum. I've beaten Wahoo, Manny Fernandez. The list goes on. Tully Blanchard and I, we're going to win the Crockett Cup. And then for the first time in months, people have actually been calling them the three horsemen lately. And he finally, he mentions Ole Anderson by name and vows that he'll be back. The Rock and Roll Express cut a promo. This was... Seriously, they, they both cut a promo. Hysterically. I don't, know if, I don't know if it was bad. It was hysterical. Robert Gibson. He's got like two lines. I'm not even sure he was awake. <laughs> it's like they pulled the string on the back of him and he robotically uttered a couple of lines while Utter- staring vacantly in two directions. Uttering is giving him way too much credit. He mumbled his way through two lines. That's all he had to do. So Ricky takes over. And he's a vastly superior promo. I realize that that's breaking news. But he's going on and on about Ric Flair. He's looking right into the camera, looking right into the heart of the viewer at home. And he's calling out Flair over and over again. And occasionally, he will remember his buddy Rob is there <laughs> and try to keep him relevant and say things. He'll point and say, Flair, I know you can't beat me. Or Robert. And when I get my hands on you, or Robert gets his hands on you, <laughs> over and over. And he mentioned, he called himself Rick Morton. Rick Morton. Not, not Ricky. There's a man's promo here. So. He's Rick Morton. Yes. Would you like to talk about Shaska Watley and the Barbarian versus Boy, would I ever. Vernon Deaton and Randy Mulkey? So as Vinny noted, the match is Vernon Deaton and Randy Mulkey against the ball bearing and Shaska Watley. The first time we've got a chance to see him since we've missed a couple of shows. Tony alerts us that fans have been writing letters and sending them through the U.S. mail asking what is going on with Shaska Watley. I thought, man, what what a time we live in now where all you have to do is go on Twitter and bitch and at Frontier Corp will immediately tweet you back and try and solve your problem. Back then you didn't have that opportunity. You had to get a goddamn piece of paper and a pen or a typewriter, and you had to write a letter, put it in an envelope, seal it up, get a stamp, and mail it. And you would not get a response. Fans have been writing letters about Shaska. The goddamn Mulkey was... Okay. Sometimes you see these jobbers, and you think, okay, maybe this guy made 25 bucks. He's got no money. He really does drive a truck. Cut the guy a little slack. This Mulkey is so frail, can't afford a gym membership. He's so goddamn pale because he can't afford to go tanning. But he fucking bleached his hair. <laughs> <laughs> got to look a star, brother. Dude, I almost vomited. Yeah, the Mulkeys were terrible. Paul Jones, now a commandante because he's a leader of an army now. He's always been... He's always led an army, a but gentleman? now... gentleman? I don't know. What do you call this? Now he for? feels like he really has an army. That's what he explained at the end of the show. He said, my army is full. Yes. Well, is the promo the promo's later. We'll talk about the promo later. Ball bearing with a face bite, which is a new one, and he just threw Deaton all over the place in the sloppiest manner possible. He did not care. He did not <laughs> care if the man... Is the old... Oh, his old line... Kill them all, let God sort them out. Yes. That's not really what I'm looking for here. If he dies, he dies. Yeah. Who said that? Uh, Ivan Drago in Rocky IV. Okay, there we go. Yeah. He, was I- he was Ivan Drago here. Yes. He was throwing this guy around. It's the guy's responsibility to not die, not barbarians. No. Barbarian's job is to throw it's you. To kill him. Your job is to land. Yeah. That's what he did here. And then Shaska hit a flying headbutt in one. I was so... At first, I was so mad that we didn't get a promo with these guys afterwards because they go to the Russians, but... I, it my, was to come. M- yes. It was worth the wait. It oh, was it, worth the oh, wait. Oh, it was worth the wait. I'm thinking about this now. This was about a year before I really started watching wrestling, and I didn't see much of Pez Watley just because I was mainly, mainly a WWF fan, and I really only got one hour... I guess the Saturday night show and then another hour, like a syndicated Saturday night show. But the point is, I didn't see him very much. Most of my exposure to him was in Pro Wrestling Illustrated and magazines like that. 
I'm pretty sure that I thought Pez Watley and Shaska Watley were different people. Oh, man. So here's the big change. Really? There were two Watleys? Why not? <laughs> there were two Mulkies. They were brothers. Maybe they were brothers. I don't know. So here is the difference between Pez and Shaska. He put on a tuxedo jacket, no shirt, just a tuxedo jacket, and a top hat. <laughs> yeah. And now he's Shaska. <laughs> yeah. Okay. He did, in fact, win with a headbutt. And then the hell get more up. do you want, Vinny? I have I no mean, idea. Come on. I don't know. He won with a headbutt and stood up and shook his ass. Koloff's got a promo. Ivan's going off about how they have the Warriors and Magnum TA right where they want them. They're angry and they're going to make a mistake. And we're going to hurt Ellering even more. And then Nikita speaks. And I think for every solid minute that Nikita Koloff speaks, I will understand one word. I was going to say... I couldn't understand a word he said. I have no idea what he was talking about. I don't about. know if he was speaking Russian. I don't know if he was speaking English. He may have been speaking Japanese for all I know. The Rock and Roll Express were set to wrestle Ray Trailer and Carl Styles. Before the match could start, out comes Ric Flair. And he's not in a suit. He is dressed to wrestle. Trunks, knee pads, boots, and wearing that big, gorgeous world championship belt. And he says, I don't want to wait. I want Ricky Morton right now. So the Express dropkick the geeks out of the ring. And Pee Wee Anderson takes the belt and he shrugs and he starts reffing the match. And so it's Ricky Morton versus Ric Flair. Let's I, just, let, I just love saying that. Ricky Morton versus Ric Flair. I hope they have this every week. Oh. So here's the story. Because every Ric Flair match you've ever seen, Flair gave him everything early. He would counter something and get foiled. Counter something and get foiled. Counter something and get foiled. And every time he tries something, it was something new. Yep. They tried basic pro wrestling stuff, headlocks and arm ringers. That didn't work. So he thought, okay, I'm going to go amateur on him. He tried to take him down, but Morton out-wrestled him. So Flair says, okay, I'm going to brawl. And he starts throwing punches, but Morton gets the better of that too. Everything Flair tries, he gets beaten. Total sprint. Back and forth, back and forth. Flair bails outside. Here's some of the... We could talk about all of the moves, but let's talk about what was so great about this match. The psychology was a thousand times better because the whole thing began when Flair came out all loud mouth and cocky and challenging Ricky Morton. Normally, you would not have the heel come out and challenge the baby face like he's, you know, Hunter coming out and challenging Roman Reigns because he's a tough guy. It works when the heel comes out and challenges the baby face and then totally gets his mouth shut, which is what happened here. Flair briefly got the heat, but only for a moment. Ricky's doing his comeback. The referee gets bumped. Flair immediately throws the guy over the top rope, which should be a DQ. Ricky gets a pinfall with a small package. He gets another pinfall. He does a high cross. Arn tries to run him off, but Robert comes in, toss him out of the way, and Robert Gibson counts the pinfall as Ricky Morton pins Ric Flair. Now, a finish like this would normally be complete horseshit, but it was so great here because, number one, Flair had made the challenge, and he got his mouth shut by little Ricky Morton. Number two, the title wasn't on the line, so... To the fans, this was a perfectly acceptable finish. Flair got his mouth shut, he got cradled, and Robert Gibson countered the pin. This was enough for the people. The people saw Ricky Morton pin Ric Flair. They know that Ricky Morton can beat Ric Flair. Now they can go all around the horn with this goddamn match, and everyone's going to pay to see them do the rematch, which Flair can win with his feet on the ropes or whatever. This was so fucking great. Among the other great things. And man, David Crockett. And there was no David Crockett. As fine a job as Tony Schiavone did. If, if, if David Crockett had been there calling this match, there would still be parts of him floating in orbit around the earth. It would be legendary. Yeah. So Gibson obviously was out there in Morton's corner. And very early on, Arn comes out in Flair's corner. And then they proceeded to do nothing but cheerlead. There was no interference. Even when the referee gets bumped, obviously, if you've been wrestling, for, if you've been watching wrestling for any length of time, if you, the referee goes down, you know usually some bullshit's about to happen. 
So the ref goes down, and the bullshit is Flair throws Morton over the top rope, which would be a DQ. He was either being a vicious asshole or deliberately trying to cost himself the match and save his title. Oh, this was not title match. That doesn't matter. He was just being a dick. But as they're brawling out there, they're literally brawling right in front of Arn Anderson, who just stands aside. Because even then, he wants his buddy Rick to have the chance to prove he's a better man like he thinks he is. He doesn't want to interfere for no reason. He wants his buddy Rick to, to, to get a chance to shine. So Flair gets pushed into the post. He's bleeding everywhere. And they they gave Morton a few visual pins, a small package spot. I think, it was, I think it was a backslide in there. And finally, Flair goes to the body press, and he hits it, except Morton rolls through and makes the cover. And now Arn interferes because now he knows his buddy's in trouble. He knows his buddy may even be beat. And he hits the ring, and that's when Gibson drop kicks him, and Gibson counts the three, and the party is on. This is a perfect pro wrestling match. It was so awesome. Let me go back and watch it again. Oh, it was great. And man, I was like, up to this point, I was just thinking, you know, the show's fine, but goddamn, it's boring. And then Ric Flair came out and saved the show. And by the time this was over, I was like, this is my favorite show of the week. There are. <laughs> and really, it sucked. There are many times watching this show. The, the, the show, frankly, it can be a, it can be a chore. It can be a bunch of squashes and promos. It wasn't short till Flair came out. And nothing newsworthy. And about every two or three weeks, something huge will happen. And this was huge. Yeah, that's the way you got to do it. It, it, it. You know what this reminds me of so much is NXT. Kind of. Yeah, I mean, everybody loves NXT. Everybody raves about TakeOver. But honest to God, if you're honest, NXT can be very boring. It can be a very simple wrestling show where nothing happens. But every three or four weeks, you get a big match on there. Yeah. And they slowly build a takeover, which is usually always a blow-away event. And then you go back to television. We didn't even watch the show this week. Because we were told it was nothing but recaps and a match with Apollo Crews versus The Drifter. I didn't even bother watching it. But you know what? Everybody talks about what a great show it is. So... Ricky Morton just completed what is quite possibly the biggest win of his career. And he goes to get a promo when who shows up to steal the spotlight but Dusty Rhodes? God, can you imagine? Just sapping all the heat off this moment. It says, Flair, every time you face a man like me or Ronnie Garvin or Ricky Morton, you end up flattening your ass. I'm going to beat you for the title in New Orleans. He did leave, and Morton did get a chance to say that he had proven he could beat Flair. He'd do it against some and be world champion. It is so amazing to go back and watch this. And you remember in the 80s when everybody just, like all the hardcore fans just hated Dusty. And you now can. he's a legend. Yes. Now all of the youngsters today, all the NXT, I mean, Dusty's like the great legend. But man, you go back and watch this stuff in the 80s and it's something to see. Stealing the spotlight, shows about him every single time. It's ironic, actually. Reminds me of some other people that we see in WWE. Just, who, things just growing up today, are going to see these people as legends. You know the legend that Hunter's going to be someday? Oh, man. All these uh, youngsters like, growing ever up. Seen before. Oh, man. Things, what comes around goes around, man. Things go in circles. I remember watching some old Portland stuff with Buddy, Buddy Wayne. And it was an angle where Buddy Rose turned heel. And he destroys the guy and leaves him laying. Crowd is... Losing their minds. Can't stand this. And Buddy Rose is cutting this promo. And I forget who it was, but one of the other heels on the show says so up to say, oh, man, that was great. I'm so proud of you. You're one of us now. And it's clearly not planned or scripted. The guy's went into business for himself. And Buddy Rose just looks at him and says, I'm on my own. <laughs> he wanted no part of that. Anyway. Jim Cornette did a quick promo. He was claiming to be incognito. His disguise consisted of dark sunglasses. Midnight Express versus Paul Garner and Bob Owens. The highlight of this match was when the announcers wished a happy 56th anniversary to Louie and Bertha Rainwater. <laughs> Louie and Bertha Rainwater. I love... This was a standby match, as they call it. It was. I love it. It's not the 50th anniversary or the 60th, 56th. <laughs> well, you know... Every one over 50 is something to celebrate. Hey. For a lot of reasons. I, I, I'm almost a two, so I shouldn't make fun. Louis and Bertha rain water. Yes. The Express beat Garner in like a minute with the double goozle. Bertha Rainwater. 
Not a wrestler. <laughs> no. A fan of the fighting rainwaters. And then we got the real main event. Do you remember when you hated number one Paul Jones? I do. Thank God you've apologized. I was wrong. I have seen the error of my ways. He's amazing. So Paul Jones is out there with the Barbarian and Shaska Watley. And he says, my army is complete. Here are two thirds of my army. <laughs> Shaska Watley and the Barbarian. And then the third third showed up by the end. It was Baron Von Raschke. That's his army, his complete army. So he's running his mouth for a while. And then Shaska says, I got a surprise for Jimmy Valiant. He pulls out a paper bag. Let's see if I can find the surprise. It's in here somewhere. Oh, look, here it is. And he pulls out a clip of Jimmy Valiant's hair that he cut off. And the barbarian is doing the finger cut motion like Brutus Beefcake. And Shaska's laughing about Jimmy Valiant. is going to shave him. Keep cutting his hair to he's shaved bald. And they're going on and on. And they're ranting about Jimmy Valiant. And they're ranting about the fans. And the fans are idiots and fools. And they're talking over each other. So it was kind of hard to pick up at first. But we went back to check. And this part is true. As Tony is wrapping up the show, literally the last thing either of them says is, Jones points to a section of the fans. And he says, and this is a quote. It's those colored people right there. That's what he said. And that's how the show went off the air. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> when the director said, cut it. Cut immediately. Yeah, we actually re re rewound it <laughs> to make sure that we like, thought. I, I must have made a mistake. That can't be what he said. Yeah. He's standing next to Shaska Watley, who got angry when another man called him the best black athlete in the world. Yeah. I'd watch my language around him if I was Paul Jones. Welcome to 1986, everybody. Things change. So everyone go watch that Flair Morton segment immediately. Unbelievable match. Saved the show. Between that and the Paul Jones army, this was a perfect television show. <laughs> Just all in the last 35 minutes or it so. Was, it was worth sitting through the rest to see that stuff. At the one and only. Woo! And really, like I said, the NWA show was a good show until who was it? It was um we uh, Jimmy Garvin killed the show. Oh God, that's right. It was great all the way up until yeah, Jimmy we, we need to uh, contact whoever's in charge to make sure he is removed from the Hall of Fame. Oh for this, this wow, match. this is this is bad. All right, seriously. Yeah. Jimmy Garvin appeared, and it did not get good until Jimmy Valiant appeared at the very end of the show. Even the Arn Anderson match. And even that wasn't as good as Jimmy Valiant's first appearance. As, as we shall see. NWA Championship Wrestling, April 20th, 1986. All right, here's the problem with the show. And it's the same, a similar problem to that retro Raw we just watched. That Raw had half the crew in South Africa and half the crew in the U.S. So it wasn't, they still had two shows to, to work with, but the roster was split. This show was taped Saturday morning slash afternoon, literally during the Crockett Cup. They started the Crockett Cup the night before with the first round matches, and uh, I presume the everything else, the second round of through, was Saturday night along with the world title match. Well, they did claim it was an afternoon session and an evening session. The yeah. afternoon session was over. The evening session was about to start. Yes, and, uh, and the Ric Flair Dusty Rhodes world title match also in the main event of that Saturday night show. So... They showed the Road Warriors and Midnight Express winning matches in the Crockett Cup against teams I did not recognize. <laughs> they did not lose their matches in this Crockett Cup. Nope. David Crockett was back this week. Thank God. In a fabulous green jacket. So Ric Flair comes out for a promo. Well, first off, they made it very clear that this Crockett Cup that they've been building up forever, the evening session is taking place tonight, and it will wrap up. A team is going to walk away with $1 million. And they noted, well, somebody noted later, some people never even see a million dollars in their lifetime. Two men tonight are walking away with a million dollars. It's crazy to think about. It is amazing. Meanwhile, there's a tag team tournament on WWE that has had four matches so far, and they've all fucking sucked. I watched the other two on SmackDown. No better? They sucked. <laughs> okay. Every match has sucked. So Flair notes that he's here in Atlanta to cut this promo. And in 20 minutes, 
He will take a limousine with Ted Turner. They will go on a Learjet and fly to New Orleans so he can defend his title that night. That is probably all true or very close to it. And if you've seen any uh, uh, examples of Ric Flair's schedule in the 1980s, you know it wasn't atypical. He did this all the time. He talked about all the women he'd have with him. Vowed, quote, I don't do no jobs in front of 70,000 people. That's what he said. And after beating Dusty Rhodes, he was going to go to the Hyatt. And he was going to buy drinks and champagne for all the women there. And Man. I, would, I would be remiss if I did not note this purple striped suit he had, one of his very best. And Flair was the man. Oh, yeah. You had the, the best world champion there was. Road Warriors versus Bill Tab and Ray Trailer. <laughs> for very large human beings. Just a squash. It was a total squash, and the Warriors grabbed these men who were virtually their own size and just threw them around with ease. Warriors, by the way, also doing this show in Atlanta and then flying to New Orleans, and they, in their case, they had to wrestle at least two more matches. They may, I, they may have wrestled four times this day. I'm not sure. Well, if you count this as a wrestling match... It, hey, the they, bell rang. They had a one-minute squash. They did moves. <laughs> they pinned a guy. They didn't even do, like, the real deal doomsday device. They did not do the doomsday device. Hawk just, it, it was a heart attack, except Hawk came off the top rope. Basically, yeah. yeah. And, and if they did they did beat Bill Tab, not Ray Trailer, because they were starting to get impressed by Ray Trailer, yes. and he was going to be something. Yes. Bill Tab was not. No. Bill Tab was beaten. Bill Tab was a large guy and had nothing else going on. It's fine. It a per, a, there are very few bad Road Warrior squashes. See, part of the problem was, early on... The stuff like the Road Warriors match was like 30 seconds, maybe. Mm -hmm. And then there was a Nighthawk match in Oahu. I mean, all of these matches were short. And then later, it was after the Magnum squash, which was maybe five seconds, as always. And then Jimmy Garvin came out and decided he was going to go an hour. And then everybody had to go an hour. I guess. Couldn't they have just given the Road Warriors 30 more seconds I don't know. and shaved 30 seconds off that Garvin match? Don't know. Dusty Rhodes and Baby Doll came out for a promo. Dusty had a hell of a cowboy head on. Made him like at least six inches taller. He noted that he also refused to do jobs in front of 70,000 people. And ran his mouth for a while. Jimmy Valley came in for a promo. <laughs> Last time we saw this man, he was heartbroken and despondent. No more. He got better. Dude, this guy. First off, he's doing his crazy Jimmy Valiant promo. And fans are just howling at this guy. Like he spouts out his lines and people are just laughing outright at him. He can not remember Shaska's new name. No. He asked repeatedly, what's his name? David? And David would tell him, and then he would call him Shitska. <laughs> That's what he said. Which I don't know if he meant to or not, but he kept calling him Shitska. He called him an Uncle Tom. Yes. For betraying the only true brother he would have in this world. He vowed to shave him bald in 85 or 86. <laughs> Even though this was in 86. My guess would be probably 86. <laughs> it's going to be difficult to do 85. And it was fucking great. It was ins absolutely insane. He talked about how Pez Watley had come crawling to his hotel room early in the morning in rough shape. And he had saved Watley's life. Then he got Watley out of a bad situation and a bad joint late at night in Philadelphia. I can only imagine. That's probably all true. And uh, it was great. And I want to add here, uh, I'm using a new uh, text editing software called, ironically, Text Edit. And uh, it has auto-corrected every time, and this is relevant. Every time I type Watley, it has auto-corrected it to Whiteley. <laughs> well, why would it auto-correct it to that? I don't know. You know another one? Oh, Tell I, me. I could go on and on about this goddamn autocorrect on my iPhone. Every time I try to write fucking, <laughs> it changes it to ducking. Oh, yeah. Have you ever in your life, for any reason, wrote the word ducking in a text message? Very rarely. You're sitting there typing, I'm trying to type this message, but people are throwing shit and I am ducking. Why the fuck would you ever use the term ducking in a text message? I don't have an answer for that. It's infuriating. Nighthawk versus Gene Ligon. This match went less than a minute, and Nighthawk still managed to flat out drop Ligon on a body slam. <laughs> he lifted him up. Well, he's trying to throw him over his shoulder for his finish. 
I guess. So he technically fucked up his finish, the shoulder breaker. He threw him over his shoulder, and then he just fell off the dude's shoulder. And then he put him on his shoulder he again. Did his shoulder breaker again. Hit it. Nighthawk, green as grass. Oh, yeah. This may, this may have been his only televised match. I don't even know if he has another one. I kind of hope so. <laughs> because he's out of the business. He's not very good. Like next month. Yeah. The Rock and Roll Express got a promo. Oh, my God. This team... How could you around? hate this show? <laughs> How is it possible that no one ever did the Randy Savage ring bell gimmick to Robert Gibson to give him an excuse to not cut promos? They should have done this every two or three months. He was so bad. What's the magician duo? Excuse me? The magician duo in Vegas with the tiger? Um, oh, God. Penn and Teller. No, they're, they're one, too. The guy with the mute. Penn and Teller is the mute. Yeah. Yes. They should have been like Penn and Teller. Who has the mirage? I know who you're talking about. Oh, my God. How can I not remember this? Siegfried and Roy. That's right. Siegfried and Roy. They should have been like Penn and Teller. They should have been like Penn and Teller. Where one guy did all the talking, which would be Ricky Morton, because he was awesome. You know what's funny about this team? I always voted for the Rock and Roll Express to go into the Hall of Fame, the Observer Hall of Fame. I argued it every year, and Dave would say, no, the Midnight Express should go in, but not the Rock and Rolls. And I would always remember that when I was coming up in wrestling as a young grappler, everybody would tell me, because I was small, I was a baby face, and they would say, you got to watch the Rock and Roll Express, and you got to watch Ricky Morton. Learn how to sell and be a great babyface. It's all I heard. But when I think about it now, Robert Gibson is in the goddamn Hall of Fame. <laughs> you know what I mean? He was a competent wrestler. He was a good wrestler. It's not even like... A miserable promo. It's not even like Ricky Morton was the good worker and Robert Gibson was the good talker. No. And so you put them together and you've got a great team. It was like... This was this was Ricky Morton was the tag team, and then there was a guy. Yes, you had to have a, you, because the little girls you had to have a brunette and you had to have a blonde. Okay, that's just how it went. And this is the brunette they found. Yeah, you with the eye, come here. Yeah, uh, Marty Jannetty has an unfair reputation as far as being the worst half of a tag team. No, he doesn't. <laughs> you weren't in, you weren't at WrestleMania weekend when he was gallivanting in a fucking uh, uh, 2016. Fountain. Yeah, the gap. Between Morton and Gibson is much greater than the gap between Shawn Michaels and Marty Jannetty. Absolutely Genetti. correct. Okay. So Morton cut a promo. Nothing against the guy. No. <laughs> but he was just, just terrible. This Ricky Morton dragged him around for a decade and made him a star. Ricky Morton was phenomenal. And he cut a great promo here. Ricky deserved to go in the Hall of Fame all by himself. So it, I'll put the whole goddamn team in. It should have been Ricky Morton going in twice. And then not Gibson. So it would be the Rock and Roll Express, Ricky Morton, and Ricky Morton. The Rock and Rock Express. Uh. Yeah. He's more of the role. All right. <laughs> I don't even know how to argue that, so I'll move on. Because Robert Gibson was just a rock. I see. <laughs> he certainly well he really wasn't the rock. He could have been a stone. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Ricky did all the work. Wahoo Medea versus a terrible wrestler named Vernon Deaton. Oh, come on. Vernon Deaton cannot take his snapmare correctly. Couldn't do anything. Couldn't do anything. Wahoo goes to throw him out of the ropes. I was a terrible pro wrestler, and the first time someone threw me between the ropes to get out of the ring, I did it exactly right. Vernon Deaton getting thrown through the ropes out of the ring, he would have been safer jumping out of a helicopter. He catches himself to the ropes, he gets hung on the apron for a while, and then he just drops and disappears. Wahoo used a lot of chops. He used a lot of face holds. Not head or neck locks, face holds. And finally, he goes for the chop elbow smash combo, but he hits the chop, and Deaton takes a bump for it and then sits up like the Undertaker. So as he's sitting up, Wahoo says, fuck it, and drops an elbow very hard into his head anyway and pins him. A bad match. You know, first off, David Crockett, thank God he was back because he loves the shit out of these chops. He'll chop anything in sight, he screams, which would have been a great vignette. Which reminds me, that when I was also a young grappler, I would open up the door and I'd practice chopping the door frame. So I learned how to throw chops. Just chop that damn door frame. Because mm -hmm. I was like Wahoo. Except Wahoo was the legit, 
He came off as the toughest fucker around. He was 48 years old. He hardly had the best physique. He didn't move fast, and he didn't do anything flashy. But when he got in there and he beat the shit out of Vernon Deaton, all you could think was, I got to stay away from this fucker. Yes. Because he'd beat the shit out of me. Oh, yeah. There's no doubt. This was a tough old bastard. And I say that with all possible respect. So Paul Jones and Shaska Watley cut a promo. They get introduced. They immediately begin shouting over each other. It's very chaotic. It's very loud. It's hard to keep track of what's going on. I believe they were talking about Jones said he wanted Valiant back so now they could finish the job. And they don't want to finish the, finish the job over the telephone. So we ended up going back to watch this whole thing. I encourage you all to go watch the segment. Watch Paul Jones and particularly just watch the, the, the tone of his skin. Because he literally changes from tan to pink to red right before your eyes. I swear to you, you can see the color f- taking over his face. It is amazing. Are you ready for me to play this? I'm ready if you are. I queued this goddamn thing up because... <laughs> Let me just play it. And then we will discuss it after... It airs here on the program. Shaska Watley. Or as he was also known as Shitska... Watley and number one Paul Jones. Paul Jones, Shuska Watley, you've been asking about Jimmy Valiant, and we heard Jimmy Valiant, and he, you know, Jimmy Valiant scared me for a while because I didn't think he was coming back. He calls me Mad Dog. Just because, let me tell you something, you don't call me Mad Dog because all I'm doing, I believe in getting justice, and justice will be done in 86. And Valiant, I'm glad you're back because we can't finish the job over the telephone. And this man right here, you called him your friend. He was never your friend. You used him. You used him. And from now on, Valiant, please stay around so this man can finish the job. When we're finished, you're going to be a ball headed you geek. I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> it gets better every what? time. It's the, Look at his face. It's, it's red. <laughs> it's so, so much there. It's the, this time, I really picked up on the, mm, when he was done. Vinny, first off, mm-hmm. uh, every week I want you to apologize for all the terrible things that you said about Paul Jones over I the years. I don't know what was wrong with me. Perhaps he was... Perhaps, this guy should be in the Hall of Fame. Perhaps he declined in 87 when I really started watching. I want you to think about something. Robert Gibson... Is in the Hall of Fame. And Paul Jones and is not. And number one Paul Jones is not. That, that is a tragedy. That is a miscarriage of justice That's right no there. no good. So, Shaska screen for a while. Let's hear him say geek one more time. It's my favorite part. Please stay around so this man can finish the job. When we're finished, you're going to be a ball headed you geek. <laughs> I'm going to tell you that's right, boss. <laughs> now, there is more. Because Shaska runs his mouth for a while. He just says he's going to give Valiant a wep- whipping. He's going to take more of his hair. And finally, he stops, and he makes his exit. And Jones pauses, and he looks in the camera. And finally, he grunts out, You're going to get it! And then he leaves. He is my hero. He is my goddamn hero. So they leave. There's about two seconds of pausing. And then in walks J.J. Dillon, baffled <laughs> by what he's just seen. He eventually rails against Ronnie Garvin for taping his fist. So there's probably all kinds of loaded weapons in there. He demands that either Garvin prove he has a broken hand and get a full cast, or prove he's healthy and stop taping his goddamn fist. I'd like to add before we go on, going back to Wahoo, when his match was over, I would be remiss if I did not mention that David Crockett referred to him, and I quote, as the mighty chief. Wahoo McDaniels. What a great fucking name. The Mighty Chief? God, the Mighty Chief Wahoo McDaniels. <laughs> it's McDaniel, by the way, but that doesn't matter to David Crock. No. He should have been the champion for like a hundred years. Every week that I see Wahoo, I love him even more. Yeah. <laughs> Wah- He's just so great. Wahoo was great. You mentioned that he wasn't doing neck holds. He was doing face holds. Yeah. 
Because his job was to put you in pain. He would grab the guy's nose or cheek or ear and just yank on it. Wahoo was awesome. You know what Yahoo, Wahoo was? Wahoo on this show is kind of like what Undertaker is now. Yeah, sort of. He is the 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 legend who's peak maybe a few years back, but he's still the guy everyone calls out and wants to beat to prove how tough they are. Kind of, but even with the Undertaker, he's he's fifty one now, mm-hmm. and and he looks like he's going to fall apart at any time. Yes, Wahoo looks like he could be the mighty chief till he's about eighty five. Fair, because no youngster is going to come up. He's a he's a big solid. He doesn't move a lot. He doesn't have to do anything athletic. He just fucking grabs you, throws you down, and tears at your face. Stop that, Chief. Magnum TA beat Paul Garner with a belly-to-belly in 20 seconds. Does this guy have the best job in the world or what? It's up there. It is way up there. I can't remember the last match he had that went more than 30 seconds. And this went about 15. Even David David Crockett was half asleep for the belly-to-belly. Yes. Paul Ellering cut a promo. This is one of those promos where a man speaks, he goes for about a minute, and he's done. And as soon as he's done, I go to write down what he said and realize, I have no idea what he said. I have no idea what he said that was entertaining or relevant about anything. He just spoke for a minute. I presume he said the Road Warriors would win the Crockett Cup, probably deal with the Russians and the Midnight Express along the way. Well, here we go. That's where the show fell off a cliff. That's where my life fell off a cliff. I may never recover. Jimmy Garvin versus George South. You know, let me preface this. Let me let me review this match by saying that the baby had been upstairs eating during this. And my wife and I alternate baby time so that she can sleep in the evening. She goes to bed early. I watch the baby. When the baby is deep asleep, I go and I put the baby in her room. And so she gets as much sleep as humanly possible. And we sleep in shifts, as they say. So... I knew that as soon as the baby was done eating, it was going to be my turn to watch the baby. I had to make dinner. So I thought, man, I'm going to have to make dinner in the middle of NWA World Championship Wrestling. I hope I don't miss anything. And I went over, and I made a stir-fry in a wok. That means I put together all of the meat. I put together all of the vegetables. I got the noodles ready. I got the rice ready. I put everything in the wok. I cooked everything in the wok. I put the rice in the bowl. I put everything in the wok on the bowl. I went over and I sat down to eat. This goddamn match was still going on. I cooked an entire meal during this match. Let me tell you something. I missed nothing. The 15 minutes you missed was a terrible 15 minutes. Garvin took this guy who everyone knew was going to lose. He used hammer locks. Oh, I was watching. He used chin locks. He used a leg lock. The announcers were just desperate for anything relevant or interesting to say. My favorite part of this match, and that is low praise, but there was a point where they tried to do worked amateur wrestling to make Garvin look like he was smothering him like Kurt Angle. It didn't work. So my mind began to wander during this eons long match. Like, how could anyone in the 1980s not have turned the channel? I realize there were, if you were lucky, 20 channels in the 1980s. But for God's sake, one of them had to have something better on than this. One of them had to. And then I began to wonder about remote controls. When exactly did they become common? I know we, I think we got our first one around this time. Perhaps in the 1980s, they weren't common. Obviously, obviously they were invented. But maybe most people didn't have them. And so for most people... That extra eight feet to walk to the TV and turn the knob, maybe that was too much trouble. And so they stayed on this match. But otherwise, I cannot fathom anyone staying tuned into this. In about a day, Garvin won with the Brain Buster. You know, when I was young, around this time actually, my dad had a remote control, which was a long stick that he had cut a notch into the end of. (laughs) Your dad is awesome. Uh... And he would reach that stick, and he would somehow get the notch. This was the most impressive thing about it. He got the notch on the... The knob. Knob, and he would turn the channel. Yeah. I'm trying to remember who had it. I swear somebody I knew had a TV. It had a remote control, but the remote control actually had a cord. (laughs) 
So it wasn't that remote. Now, with all that in mind, that was not the worst match on the show. <laughs> oh, my God. Or the longest. Listen, I love Ivan Koloff. I've argued many times this man is a Hall of Famer. He should go into the Hall of Fame merely for selling for Tony Zane. <laughs> But by the time this match was over, ah. You could build a Hall of Fame, a physical Hall of Fame, erect a building, and the time it took for this match to go on. Literally, this had to have won worst match of the year. First, Rage and Bull cut a promo, hyping up his match against Darn. He was excited that Ole wasn't there, he'd get a fair fight. Then, Jimmy Garvin and Precious cut a promo. They ran down Wahoo. Said, I'm tired of chasing this man. I may have to target somebody else. I'm the best wrestler and the prettiest man in the world. It's a good thing he could talk. And then, Ivan Koloff versus Tony Zane. Tony Zane. This match legit had to be longer than Koloff's world championship reign. (laughs) Where was Tony Zane when you were breaking in? He'd have carried your bags. I was going to say, he may may have still been training. He would have been the guy, you would have been inside the car when we locked him out. Yes. (laughs) This Uh, fucking guy. This was so bad. He didn't know how to run the ropes. He didn't know how to take an elbow. He didn't know how to take a bump. At this point, I wrote, this went forever as Koloff refused to pin Tony Zane. And then after that, let's see, after I wrote that it went too long. He kept going. Yeah, I'm trying to see if I can find a word count on here. Uh, Not easily. I wrote about the 100 words after that. Why? I feel like it's my job to record what's going on. (laughs) What did you record? That it kept going and you were ready to kill yourself? In all capitals, pin him, hit him with a move, and pin him. This is an all-time terrible episode of this show. The actual Cold War didn't go as long as this match. They tease a countout. It went through a break. (laughs) That was funny. It 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 goes to the break, and Shivani says, We'll be back with our number two. And I thought he meant of this specific match. Zayn made a second comeback. You know what's funny? It went so long that when he made the second comeback, everybody actually went nuts. I couldn't even believe it's my eyes. because they had seen Ivan hit 7,000 moves in a row. Just anything different. So finally, Ivan hit a Russian oh. sickle, a hideous bump by the fat man, and Ivan won. This was really, really, really bad. It's an abomination of a match. It was hideous. Russians get a promo. Imagine if you wrote a speech or promo, whatever. How about, how about I got one better for you? Okay. I have an easier time understanding Ahmed Johnson. Oh, easily. Yeah. If you, Nikita's promos, just imagine, write down any sentence or any paragraph, whatever you want, and then go through and replace all the consonants with like M or V, and that's it. <laughs> and then try to decipher it. By the time this promo was over, I thought, you know what's coming next? It's going to be the Baron. But I was wrong. Even they knew to follow all of this up with a Baron Von Raschke match would have been a bad idea. I even ran down Americans for smoking, and this also went on and on. Dusty and Baby, Baby Doll returned. This was interesting. Baby Doll vowed to take care of Dusty's trip to New Orleans, and she disappeared. She said, don't worry if you don't see me there tonight. I'm just Handling the travel arrangements. I missed that line. Foreshadowing. Mm -hmm. So she disappeared. We got Arn Anderson versus Raging Bull with Dusty doing commentary, often shown on an inset promo. God, this Dusty. This was not the mid-90s funny Uncle Dusty Rhodes deal. This was mid-80s know-it-all Frank Mir Dusty. (laughs) It's true. He just goddamn knew everything about everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've never... By the way, first and only time you are here, Dusty Rhodes compared to Frank Mir. You haven't seen Frank Mir lately. I guess I have not. <laughs> <laughs> He's reaching dusty proportions. He's a splotch. He's one giant splotch. Didn't he gain a lot of weight after his motorcycle crash and then say he never get fat again? Well, you know. Things change. Yeah. yeah. So, I guess this was a good match. It was the best thing on this show in quite a while. If if this would have if this would have followed, like if we would have taken after the Magnum squash, if you would have taken the Tony Zane match and the Jimmy Garvin match off the show and put this match in, it probably would have been much better. 
This but was it followed such insufferable action. This was a very good ten minute match dragged out over twenty minutes. It went a long time. And that was actually the idea of the match. Arn was trying to stall out the TV time limit. Arn's the TV champion. There's a twenty minute time limit. If he gets to a draw, he retains his title, so that was his goal. So ordinarily a match will consist of three parts. The Shine, as it is sometimes called, where the babyface destroys the bad guy. The heat, where the bad guy cheats to take advantage and gets his offense in. And then the finish, where there's a comeback and they go back and forth and do whatever the end is. And usually those are all about the same time. In this 20-minute match, the Shine went about 18 and a half minutes. <laughs> just Rage and Bull just beat him and beat him and beat him and beat him and beat him. Finally, Arn like, kicks him into the corner and Bull goes down. And then Tony says, we're almost out of time. So they did some stuff. Manny comes back, hits the flying form. The time limit draw expires, and Arn gets his leg on the ropes. So was the draw. I think Arn was just covering all of his bases. I guess so. The bell didn't ring when it was supposed to. So here's the way they did for the post match. JJ Dillon comes out to argue with Dusty. As they're shouting at each other, which is not shown on camera, but it's heard, Tully Blanchard hits the ring, and the horsemen begin a double team rage and bull. <laughs> Meanwhile, you can hear David Crockett screaming at Dusty to turn around. That's right. But Dusty is focused on Dylan. For like 30 seconds, this goes on until finally Dusty realizes what's going on and Garvin comes out and hits the ring and they chase the horseman away. Ron Garvin, I should clarify. Have they mentioned, by the way, there's a guy named Ron Garvin on the show and a guy named Jimmy Garvin on the show. Eventually, they talk about them being brothers. But have they even hinted at it here? No. That's odd. Jim Cornette cut a promo. He vowed the Midnight Express to win the Crockett, Cro- Crockett Cup. This was the best promo of the year so far. You were so far gone, you didn't hear a word he I, said. No, you're right. He was I, I, I was, awesome. I was past, long past the point of no return. This show has killed me, I wrote. Yeah, he said they win the Crockett Cup. They would beat the Road Warriors, beat the Rockland Express. He, to make a long story short, he said Magnum and TA and Dusty Rhodes, they wanted a contract for a tag title match. But they never ever wrestled as a team. So, no. Which was a great point. We got the Minute Express versus Art Pritz and Bob Pearson. The highlight was where Bobby Eaton dragged one of the geeks over the announce desk. This would be Pearson. So Shivani's microphone could pick up his screams. Listen, God bless this Pearson fella. I could not find a thing about him. There was a Bob Pearson that recently passed away. I don't know if it's the same guy. I have no idea. All I know is he was a different kind of appalling jobber. He looked about 55 years old, bald on top, didn't even trim the rest, totally pale, hairy, and skinny. Perfect. And he was beaten unmercifully. <laughs> That's what jobbers should be. They hit him with a bombs away knee drop, and then they go and they're going to hit him with the skull-crushing finale, Dennis Condry. The Miz's goddamn finish. Every time that I've seen Dennis Condry do this, I've been blown away by how awesome this move looks. Because when Miz does it, it doesn't look this awesome. No. Well, it didn't look awesome here either. Because Bob Pearson could not get in the proper position to take the move, number one. And number two, I thought that he was going to be killed taking this move. (laughs) Yeah, but he, he lost. Dylan and Blanchard came out for a promo. Blanchard's face was all cut up. Stitches and blood everywhere. And Dylan's talking about all the brutal matches he's been through. And Blanchard said, Blanchard cut a great promo. I was awake enough to recognize this. He says, scars like this were the sign of a man who had survived and thrived in this business. And through all the damage, all the barbed wire matches, all the strap matches, I'm still here. I'm still a champion, and I'm still talking. That was great. Called Baby Doll a moose again. A few people called her a moose. I think Cornette did, too. That's right. That's her. It's her gimmick. She's a moose. Mm-hmm. It's not very nice. No. I suppose it's not. Ronnie Garvin cut a promo considering his taped-up fist. The NWA apparently wants to bar him from wearing tape on his fist, but it's just a rumor because nobody's told him anything yet. I see. <laughs> what an organization. And then he said, I'm even dangerous when I'm asleep. He said, I'm dangerous either way. I'm even dangerous when I'm asleep. What the hell does that mean? Let's not find out. So Ronnie Garvin wrestled Brody Chase. <laughs> this was Ronnie Garvin. David Crockett was so done with this show, much like you. Yes, even David Crockett knew this was a bad show. 
Ronnie Garvin applied his favorite sugar hold that David Crockett mentions every goddamn single time he applies it, except this time. Garvin puts him in the sugar hold, and David Crockett doesn't even notice. And then, Ronnie Garvin, I guess to make sure David Crockett noticed, he adds a grapevine, or as Pedro Sauer calls it, grape the vine, to the man's legs. A sugar hold with a grape the vine. Now, this jobber cannot get the fuck out of this hold. <laughs> He's trapped. He's near death. But God damn it, he won't give up. He's in there for like five minutes. Finally, he taps the mat violently, but it's 1986, so that's not a submission. And eventually, Garvin just lets go. And they keep wrestling. Yes. So Garvin's hand was hurt, so instead of winning with the knockout punch, he won with a knee lift and a splash. It's too bad Garvin was such a shitty promo, because he did come across like a tough guy. Mm -hmm. And he had great matches. Yeah. Even the squash was a fun squash. Mostly because of the sugar hold with the grape divine. The main event was the Boogie Woogie Man returning for another promo. <laughs> Jimmy Valiant comes back. He's already done a promo an hour <laughs> earlier. Yeah. He cannot fucking remember Shaska Watley's name. He asks for the third time, what's his name again? Shiska. He also can't remember Napoleon's name. No. He's talking about how Paul Jones is a complex because he's so short. And he turns to Tony and says, who's that guy who put his hand on his chest like this? Tony just says, Napoleon. Napoleon! That's it. He's ranting and raving, and he explains in his words. He has been talking to the brothers in the street. The real brothers. And they said, Shaska, he was no brother. He vowed again that Paul Jones will be bald, and then thank the Lord above, this show ended. A historically awful program. Oh, come on. This was the best thing on the show. They're both... Fine! This is the best feud. <laughs> so what? They're both threatening to shave the other one bald. That's true. One of these men, at the end of the day, is going to be a bald-headed geek. Or, as Paul Jones would say, a geek. Mm. <laughs> it's a, it's a three-syllable word now, right. and the middle syllable is really long. One more time. I got it right here. I'm going to be a bald-headed geek! I'm going to tell you that's right, folks! <laughs> oh, my lord. A bald-headed geek! And why does everyone like to mention it's 1986? Why is that such a big deal it's in so 86? Important. I'm going to get my revenge in 86. And it, it's, it's everybody. A it's April. If it was the new year, okay. No. <laughs> You're a third of the way through it, dude. It's a very big deal to mention it's 1986. Hey, <laughs> I had fun mostly because you had such a miserable time. I did not enjoy that show. And granted, this show sucked. <laughs> Do not, I don't want anyone on the board blaming it on Vinny and saying that he's too bitter. This show fucking sucked. At least that middle portion. All right, everybody. You're gonna be mine all night long. Anyway. All right. NWA Championship Wrestling, April 26th, 1986. I don't know who put together the opening of the show. Dave Gray said it had to have been Dusty. Maybe he was right. But this was so emotionally incoherent. First of all, they show an angle. You know, the, the, the show always starts with an action clip. And the action clip was Crusher Crusher and the Russians attacking Magnum TA and hitting him with a crutch. None of this was ever mentioned again, by the way. So they go to the announcers. Hey, it was a packed show. We had to get all these squash matches in. <laughs> there wasn't time to enumerate, or whatever the word would be, on this in this situation. So it's David Crockett and Tony Schiavone, and they are in a very somber tone. <laughs> Hushed voices as they explain, we regret to tell you, Baby Doll has been hurt. Hurt bad, says David Crockett. Hurt bad. She was attacked by Jim Cornette. Jim Cornette and the Midnight Express, they made Dusty Rhodes watch as they attacked her, and she's been hurt. Meanwhile, we're coming off the Crockett Cup. The Road Warriors are the new Crockett Cup champions. They won a million dollars. It was a great show. In other news, the Four Horsemen have badly attacked Ricky Morton in the locker room and <laughs> injured him. This was, this was uh, disorienting. You know what it was? It was a, it was a, it was a good news sandwich. 
Jimmy Valiant versus Kent Glover. Appropriate here in 2016 after the passing of Prince, Jimmy Valiant comes out in purple tights with purple heart written on the back. That's what it said. So, your buddy Dave brought his young daughter over. She's six or seven. And she watched Valiant for about a second and a half and said, that's a jolly man. <laughs> She's right. She's exactly right. It's too bad she had to go to school. I would have got her on the show to talk about Jimmy Valiant. <laughs> this jolly man did every single illegal move you can do in a wrestling ring. I, I actually forgot to start immediately when he began. Recording all the movies he did? Yes, but I did start about three moves in. I can conf- I can I can't confirm, but I strongly suspect based on the rest of the moves that the first few moves were in fact also cheating. But I can tell you that he did a thumb to the neck, a backdrop, head rammed into post, eye rake, snap mare, nerve hold, thumb to throat, snap mare, fingers to the eyes, which by the way means that he performed a snap mare and then lifted the man up to poke him in the eyes. Yes. Pulled him down by the hair, choked him with the knee as he argued with the referee, raked his eyes on the ropes, and then threw him into the turnbuckle and hit the boogie elbow for the pin. This is a much, much higher cheating ratio than the oh, last God. time I did this. Dude, th- there's... Jesse Ventura used to say, "Win if you... I think it was Jesse. Some, one of the old WWF heel announcers said, win if you can, lose if you must, but always cheat. Yes. No one has followed that credo and taken it to heart like Jimmy Valiant. Yes. There's no one, no one cheats exclusively as, as a percentage of his total offense is Jimmy Valiant. Rage and Bull then cut a promo. You mentioned earlier that once uh, many years ago on the show, you interviewed a man who was on substances. Uh, I think those substances may have been shared here by the Bull. He was rambling on about Shaska Watley and Jimmy Valiant and said, you can mess with the man's money or mess with his women, but you never mess with his hair. What? Hey, hair's very valuable there in the 80s. He was rambling all over the place, starts going off about Abdullah the Butcher and rice patties. Dude, I was wrong. 50% of his moves were legal. Well, those are the three you missed. That's true. That might have skewed the ratio. I know for sure one of those is a closed fist punch, which is technically illegal. If he did one other legal move, it's, yeah. it's man, it's, it's shocking. It just seems like he's cheating the whole time, but he's really not. He's only cheating half the time. <laughs> yeah, he's only cheating half the time. So, Raging Bull talking about Abdullah and Rice Patties. And again, we are now almost in May, and he declares it's 1986. What was the... Th- everyone. Always going off about what year it was. All I know is he looked like he was about to burst out laughing the entire time. Yes. So, I presume he'd watched the previous match. He probably watched Kent Glover in that previous match, who... <laughs> oh, my God. You should have seen him selling, getting hit, thrown into the top turnbuckle. You've never seen anything like this. On your worst day, Vinny, on day one of wrestling training, you hit a buckle better than Kent Glover. He talked about how, yes, you could take one of his old ladies, but don't mess with his hair. Abby is somewhere in a rice paddy getting fatter. And then he spoke Spanish, and he said boogie in Spanish, which is, for the record, boogie. Hmm. I liked it. So after the break, he got in the ring to wrestle Art Pritz. And uh, whatever he may have been on, it did not affect his wrestling ability. He schooled him on the map for a while, including a double chicken wing, which I have not seen in years. They did did this for about three minutes, and then they did one big high high spot with a bunch of drop downs and leapfrogs. And he hit the flying forearm, which is called the flying burrito, which means we got to hear David Crockett scream, burrito, like no man before or since for the win. Got to give this Art Pritz guy credit. Decent jobber. He could take bumps. He could grab a body part and pretend it hurt, and he was ugly. That's but, all important. But he was ugly, but he did not look like he was wheeled in from a nearby hospital. So I got to give him credit for all of that. If there's one lesson to be learned from the show, these shows, it's that the title jobber is actually a there's a broad spectrum. Yeah, uh, of of men, there, there's competent men who never win, but if you ask them to have a good match, they could do it, like Italian Stallion. Uh, George South, maybe. Then the other end, there's guys who appear to have never tied up boots or set foot in a ring or run the ropes before. We'll get to some of those, too. By the way, the fans in the crowd very intently watching this squash match. So, they showed a clip from a... 
I guess it was another show, but Shaska Watley and Paul Jones had just beaten a jobber and they were trying to cut his hair. And the scissors they had to cut this man's hair they weren't quite beefcake style garden shears, but they were very long. They looked very, very sharp. I could not believe you had these six crazy motherfuckers in the ring and a giant pair of scissors. <laughs> just floating around on the mat. Oh. So, yes, Boogie comes in to make the save. Boogie Woogie Man and Baron Von Rasky trading forearms, a sight to behold. And, yes, uh, Rage and Bull's in there and Nighthawk is in there. And sharp, pointy scissors ready to stab a man just hanging out. And eventually the baby faces cleared the ring. Ron Garvin was in the ring to wrestle. But before the match could start, J.J. Dillon comes stampeding out. He interrupts everything. He announces, we have gotten word from the NWA and they have agreed with Dillon. Garvin will no longer be able to illegally tape his fist. He had to take the tape off immediately. Garvin did so, but he was pissed about it. So we got Ron Garvin versus Paul Garner. Paul Garner from day one should have just done the uh, descendant of Abraham Lincoln gimmick. Looked exactly like him. Abe was a wrestler. Garvin beat him up for a while. He was a sugar hold. Need him in the ass. Damn sugar hold. Highlight was when Garvin, Garvin has a jumping no hands headbutt. And Garner flops around like a fish. And Garvin has a splash for the win. So Garvin then cuts a promo. So the people who took his tape away, they were just crybabies. He bragged about the U.S. bombing a terrorist. Threatened to break into the horsemen's homes and beat them up in their beds. He noted a lot of people don't like the horsemen. And then he left. Well, it's weird he was just like, anybody who doesn't like my tape fist is a crybaby. I'm proud to be an American. I was like, what does that have to do with anything? <laughs> don't know. Plus, you're from Canada. And he is still coming after Ric Flair. Yes. For those of you that aren't sure, yes, he's still coming after the horsemen. The Road Warriors cut a promo. Hawk did the gimmick where he flexed his neck until his collar popped off. Ellering says the real winners of the Crockett Cup were the fans who got to see so much great action. And now that we've won, we're going after the Midnight Express and the tag titles. And the fan, a fan held up a sign reading Legend of Doom. <laughs> Team sounds scary. I hope the Road Warriors never have to face them. And Animal noted we beat the Midnight Express in the tournament. Now we're going to beat him for the tag belts. Hawk starts talking about in Baltimore that night, they got a double chain match with the Russians. And uh, you know how we've said how Hawk promos in 1986 are different than the Hawk promos in 97, where he's always making silly jokes and insults? Well, here he did call the Russians a crotchety load of soggy buzzard barf. Had the fans howling with laughter. Had a Crockett Cup highlight video. Ah, 1980s music and about 5,000 random photographs. It, it was picture, 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 short video clip, picture, picture, picture. So I didn't get a lot of this, but it, some of the faces who were in this tournament who we have not seen on the show, Bill Dundee, the Sheep Herders, Eddie Gilbert, Rick Steiner, Clips of the Fantastics against the Horsemen. I want to see that match so badly. That sounds awesome. Tiger Mask, Giant Baba, Steve Williams, and then finally the Road Warriors beating Ron Garvin and Magnum in the finals. And they zoomed in on the, on the check for $1 million to prove it was legit. $1 million. I wish it would have said Road Warriors, comma, the... <laughs> They should have had one of the big publisher's clearinghouse checks. Sure. Road Warriors versus Jeff Smith and Randy Mulkey. Everybody I, named Jeff Smith. It's not this one, because this guy must be dead by now. <laughs> no one could survive this match. Wow. Now I'm talking about how the beating he took in this match. Well, yeah. The Mulkey actually took the worst beating when he got thrown outside and splatted on his ass on the cement. And he has no padding. No. Both guys took hellacious beatings. But yes, the Mulkey. I remember the first time I was taught how to get thrown out of the ring. Not even over the top rope, just through the ropes. And they showed me, you lean out, you put your hand on the apron, you jump and kick your feet through when you're on the floor. I did it one time slowly, then I did it one time full speed, never had to practice it again. Mulkey had no clue what he was doing. He goes through the ropes horizontally. He rolls over, inserts of the apron, never finds it. And it's like it was like Wile E. Coyote flying off the top of the cliff, pausing in midair, and then plummeting down. That's what the Mulkey did. Onto his ass. Yes. Splat. And then he laid there unmoving like a slug. 
They also beat the crap out of Jeff Smith, and they won with a top rope splash. And this Jeff Smith guy, definitely not my buddy. He is horrible. Hit the ropes all wacky. Did that thing where you hit the ropes and you, li- you lift your leg like five feet up in the air every time oh, you yeah. hit the ropes. Yeah. Took a wacky bump every time. Fell down. Ah, oh, classic bad jobber. Just a squash for the ages here. Hey, but they're a million dollars richer. That they ain't getting paid by the hour, and they got a million bucks in the bank. So just get out there and kill this goddamn mold. And they got to get in a plane and get to Baltimore. So after the break. Crockett is talking about Flair and Morton. As he's going off, someone walks right in front of the camera. Tony Schiavone is totally confused. We later re- figured out it was Shaska Watley. And they showed the Flair and Morton angle. And there was a six-man elimination tag. It, came, it was Dusty and the Rock and Roll Express against the Horsemen. It came down to Flair and Morton, and Morton got the win with a small package. That's right. So last week on TV, he got a visual pin where his, his uh, partner counted the pinfall. Now here he is pinning Flair in a legitimate match with a referee, outresting him. This enraged the horsemen. They went in the Rock and Roll's dressing room. They attacked both men, and the, the big spot was rubbing Morton's face in the cement. Bloodied them all up. There's blood everywhere. Yes. And Dusty and his buddies eventually made the, sh- made the save. What a terrible thing to do to a teen idol. Oh, yeah. Rub his face all over that sandpapery floor. Baron Von Raschke and Shaska Watley versus Bill Tab and Lee Peak. <laughs> Bill Tab and Lee Peak. Lee Peak. This guy. You know how you, by the way, I think you mentioned last week your buddy Dave Gray. You can't call him Dave. Has yeah. to be Dave Gray every time. Yeah. Bill Tab and Lee Peak also fall in that category. Exactly. Yeah. You, you never say Bill and Lee. No. You never say, hey, Tab and Peak are on the card. No, tonight. it's Bill Tab and Lee Peak. Bill Tab and Lee Peak. And my God, this Lee Peak fella. First off, he chose the name Peak. Like, this is it. The peak. <laughs> this the, is... The, the peak of the mountain. Yeah, this is Lee Peak. He actually spelled it P-E-E-K. Yeah. Like a peeping Tom. Yeah, that's even worse. <laughs> Lee Peak. And Bill pick up the tab. <laughs> sure. So, Lee Peak... Uh, oh, my God, you should have seen Lee Peak sell the bear hug. He did not fare as badly as uh, the Mulk he had in the prior match, but he was also fooling through the ropes and also nearly killed himself. Someone needed to take all these jobbers aside and say, this is how you do this. Just do that for an hour so there's not a death on the show. So there was lots of choking, lots of stomps, lots of forearms. I got bored. It kept going. It kept going. This was the one match on the show that just went on. They had the full crew back. Yeah. So it wasn't like last week where it was a half crew, and it was like, go out there and waste an hour on a fucking match. These were just short, quick squash matches, except this one, which just forever. Long past the point where I was begging for it to end, it went through a break. And when it came back, they wrestled two or three more minutes, and Shaska got one of the superplex. Now, here's the thing. For historical purposes, I may need to go back and watch this to catalog A, exactly how long it went, and B, did the jobbers get any offense? Did they throw one punch? Did they hit a chop? Anything. Because I'm not going to lie to you and say my attention didn't waver. But I don't remember them doing anything in like 15 minutes. And I want to go back and check and make sure that's true. Hey, go for it, dude, because I'm not going to. And I think, it's, I think it's highly, highly, highly likely. If I, I, I don't think they hit any moves. If they did, I'm quite certain they got less offense in 50 minutes than uh, Jimmy Valiant did in one. All I know is the only move that mattered was after Shaska won with a second rope superplex. Number one, Paul Jones, my favorite wrestler in the world, got in the ring. He stood over whoever it was, Lee Peek or whatever guy it was, and he looked at him with disdain, and he lifted his knee high in the air, and essentially, he just kind of fell down on him. Yeah, I was going to say, don't call the it a knee drop. Fucking don't. worst <laughs> knee drop of all time. And he was so proud. And I looked at you. That man made his made a living as a pro wrestler for many years. He was, to some degree, a star. And hey, that was his knee drop. He wasn't just a star. He was a goddamn legend. Well, on that note, Paul Jones, Shaska Wally, and Baron Von Raschke then joined Tony Schiavone for a promo. Back at ringside... Destructive. 
from Paul Jones, <laughs> Shuska, Baron Von Reschke, <laughs> calling for Jimmy Valiant many times during the match. You know, when you have a war, you have to have two sides. Well, Valiant has made it obvious that he wants to retaliate to my war. Well, Valiant, I haven't got here. Two of my great warriors, two men here. I am going to let Shaska talk to you. Remember, Shaska, your best bodyguard. Me, Valiant. I'm the man that cut Shaska's a hell of a promo. I'm the one that cut your hair. And Baron, he the one that's going to crush your brain. And I'm going to tell you what, with the ingenious leadership, that's right, I'm about. We are going to destroy you. Talking. And I'm gonna tell you another thing. If you think we ain't serious, if you think we don't mean nothing, step into the ring with us, sucker! Barrel! That's his nickname! I don't have a goddamn idea what the Baron's saying. He may as well be Nikita. Or, uh. What's his name? Ahmed Johnson. Magnum GDs! Dusty Rhodes! And we're ready, we're willing, and we're able. We are trained by a superior mind. We are superior athletes. What are the Baron's ears are gigantic. Still talking about Tijo Khan, who we haven't seen in months. all of our foes. Underfoot. Underfoot. You know what gets to be He knows it's just fucking get to Jessica can do it again. Jessica, the next time you get in the ring with Ian, I want to see a ball headed G. <laughs> That's what it's going to be. A ball headed G. I'm going to tell you another thing, buddy. You with the Papa Bell Street. See Tony's face. Phone. You is in a whole lot of trouble. <laughs> We're coming right back. Don't go away. <laughs> Just the greatest. The last 30 seconds of that, after the Baron finishes his turn, and it cuts to a wide shot, and you see the whole crew. And it's like 30 seconds of Paul Jones screaming and Shaska dancing and Baron just being the Baron. It's the best. I, the, I, I need a gif of just that. What is the best is when they go to commercial. Right after that, there is a, there is a still frame of the Baron with some guy in a chin lock. And it says, let's face it, because it's the Baron's face. Right. The best is right here. And what could be better? Uh, let's just stop the show. <laughs> that was the best part of the show, There everybody. is nothing better on this show than, than, than Paul Jones. That may have been better than Mark Briscoe in Tokyo. It's close. Last week's was, not this week's. All right. That's true. The bald headed geek. Yeah. So Ric Flair comes out for a promo. And the more I think about this, the more I realize how much I love this. Because you see, for weeks, maybe months now, Ric Flair has been belittling Ricky Morton and his fans. He says, Ricky, you get all the girls in the training bras, I get the girls with the double Ds. Blowing it off. But after the attack in the locker room, after this promo, you realize, you know what? It does bother Ric Flair how much the girls cheer for Ricky Morton. It... <laughs> It, it hurts him. He explains that Ricky is not pretty. He is an ugly duckling, and no woman in the world would pick Morton over Flair. He says, as world champion, he's used to getting what he wanted, and he wants the world to see what a punk Morton was. And he listed all the cities that week where he'd be defending the title and all the men he'd be, he'd be uh, defending against, including Bob Armstrong. Oh! And what I bet was a lot of fun. Wahoo McDaniel beat Jim Dawson with a chop and elbow drop in a minute. Nothing to say. Except he did this match. And then they cut to the, uh, you know, the announced podium slash promo area, which is 15 feet from the ring and dead center. And there's Jimmy Garvin, who for like two months now has said he's been hunting Wahoo. And Wahoo, in return, has said he'd love to get his hands on Jimmy sometime. Well, here they are. And nothing happens. It was very weird. At least... I cannot explain it. Jimmy did not pretend that he cannot find this man anymore. Instead, he said he cannot get a match. So, first he said, actually, that uh, it was especially true... It, it was true before, but now that Baby Doll is on the shelf, it's especially true that Precious is the most beautiful woman in wrestling. 
Then he said he had gifts for Wahoo. He would give him these gifts in exchange for a match. He had the Comanche Chief playset from the dollar store, although in 1986 it would have been the 30 Ten cent store. Yeah. And he said he had the toy tomahawk. He said all sorts of trinkets that your squaw can wear in your teepee. Wow. And also, man. Beef, also, beef jerky. Oh. Just to eat. 86. Yeah. And Wahoo never showed up to claim these gifts. The announcers solemnly said they did not want to show what happened to Baby Doll, but it was part of their job and they had to do it. So it was Cornette and the Midnight Express in the ring cutting a promo. Cornette called out Dusty, who came out with Baby Doll. And Cornette ran his mouth for a while until Dusty attacked all three men. And yes, Dusty did throw the first punch. He laid out all three men. Three men were not enough to, to conquer the mighty and uh, devastating Dusty Rhodes until they cheated. Mm. Hit him with a tennis racket shot. So they're beating up Dusty with a racket. Baby Doll jumps on Eaton's back. He throws an elbow as she's on his back to uh, shake her off. And that was horrific enough. But then the Express held up, I think, Condry held up Dusty, made him watch as Eaton held Baby Doll's arms behind her and Cornette hit a racket shot to the gut. And uh, placement nuts. He was out of this world. Every baby face wrestler on the roster hit the ring. Seriously, like a dozen men. That's right. They chased the express away. The express express took over the announce desk. They were saying that women didn't belong in wrestling. Eden actually interrupted Cornette to say that. And they're all laughing and smiling and proud of what they'd done. As eight men carried Baby Doll out of the ring. That's right. Cornette screaming that Baby Doll is big and fat and ugly. And the ring is no place for a woman. Yes. So the heavy duty angle. Oh, yeah. They cut from this back to the announce desk in the studio where a very, very angry Dusty Rhodes and Magnum TA are. You know, when you look at Magnum through 2016 eyes, it's like, man, what a, what a raging promo this guy could do. And at the time, he was not known as a great promo. No. The, t- the world has changed, and not for the better. No. So they're screaming about how evil and nefarious Cornette is, and how they'll never forget Baby Doll screams. Magnum says, it's true, I haven't always seen eye to eye with Baby Doll. Lord knows we've had our run-ins when she was with Tully Blanchard, but I've gotten to know her now. That's a decent woman, and I will always stand by her. And Dusty talks about all Baby Doll's gone through. She came into the sport with nothing, took abuse from the fans, took abuse from Tully Blanchard. Put up with a lot to get with where she is. And then he became the ultimate feminist, talking about all the women had to put up with day to day in this world, how none of us would be here without for the women. And they all agreed this is no longer about the titles. He said Baby Doll had been worried for a few hours that she'd never be able to have children. Yes. That's heavy duty. That is heavy duty. He said there'd be a good old ass kicking, but you can't say ass on NWA World Championship Wrestling. You got bleeped. Can you imagine? Rock and Roll Express versus Ron Rossi and Bob Owens. Morton's face was all bandaged after the locker room attack, and they won with the double drop kick in a minute. Cornette comes out for a promo. Shivani's going inter- interview him, and Shivani explains, David Crockett is not here. He has left the set in disgust. He refuses to talk to you. Yes. So Cornette says, look, it's this natural way of things. Men dominate all professional sports. And Baby Doll... She got what she deserved for jumping eating from behind like a coward. This led to the Midnight Express versus Rocky King and George South. King and South got way more offense. I got to talk specs. more about this Cornette deal. Talked about this big heifer he kept calling her. Yes, in, and in the match too. Jumped his men in the first place, got what she deserved. They beat up the horse while the sheriff watched. That's the way he described it. And he said this Magnum is such a coward. He didn't even have the guts to show up that day because he knew what we were going to do. Jim Cornette, I don't care what anybody thinks about Jim Cornette in 2016. This guy was a goddamn amazing promo. He was so good. A total heat magnet. And then we had Rocky King and George South versus the Midnights in a total squash. Well, it was, although by the standards of the show... King and South got a lot more offense than Bill Tab and Lee Peak, for example. They did get squashed, and the Express won with a back suplex, top rope elbow combo. 
The Rock and Roll Express came out for a promo, although really it was just Ricky Morton and his sidekick, his silent sidekick, Rob. He had some very unconvincing makeup on. He vowed that he would soon be world champion, and that was really it. Tully Blanchard versus Mike Simani. I don't know what got into Tully this week, but he beat the fuck out of this guy. The moment this thing this thing shot suplex in a minute. Because he remembered he was the man. I guess. You know what I got out of his promo afterwards with JJ was Tully Blanchard was the original big dog. It's Roman Reigns' gimmick. Mm-hmm. And the original utterance of, and that's the bottom line. That I noticed. Yeah. I like that before addressing uh, whatever the horsemen, horsemen were involved in, they mentioned Baby Doll. They have a history with Baby Doll. And they said, well, I don't see what the big deal is. People get hurt in the sport all the time. That's a great line. And they talked about how, yes, we beat the crap out of Ricky Morton. That's just about intimidation. The same thing as Dusty Rhodes' boot and Ron Garvin's illegal tape fist. So there. So the Koloff's got a promo. And this was funny because in many ways, this is kind of like a reset show where everyone's been running in circles for months. Now they're kind of switching things up. So Dusty, instead of challenging Flair, is challenging the Midnight Express. Road Warriors are now challenging, also challenging the Midnight Express, actually. The Rock and Roll Express have stopped chasing the tag titles. They're going after Flair. And these poor Russians, stuck in the same spot. Calling out the Road Warriors who don't care about them. Calling out Magnum who doesn't care about them anymore. I'm sure this was a ruling handed down from the Kremlin. They did Stay the course. <laughs> they didn't mention something. They had some clip of Nikita and Magnum in a chain match and... It was actually great because they say, let's go to a clip of that match. And Ivan says, here you see Nikita is the master of the chain match. And they go to Nikita and he's just standing there with a chain on his arm. So something about how they want the U.S. title and the tag titles and whatever. <laughs> Arn Anderson versus Gene Ligon. As I wrote here, Arn worked the arm forever and won with the Gord Buster. He just took him apart and pinned him with his move. He did. And then the three horsemen and J.J. Dillon came out to cut a promo together. And it's funny. <laughs> this was great. It was a great promo, too. But watching these shows, it's funny how rarely they're actually all on camera at the same time. But this is one of them. What I got out of this was I like Tony Schiavone and I like David Crockett. But, man, J.J. went out there and he just trumped them. He outright said, we don't need you here. I'll handle your job. And then he did it better than they do. So much. <laughs> it was amazing. He was a great interviewer. Tully Arn ran his mouth and Tully ran his mouth. And of course, Ric Flair went last and he was the best. Said all the women of New Orleans knew how great they were. Called themselves three bad white boys. And finally, JJ wrapped up the show. Thanks a lot, Rick. Thanks for joining us, everyone. We'll see you next week. And that was the end of the show. He was great. Hey, I like this one so much better than last week. God, yes. Really, it's just like a bunch of squash matches to build up arena matches we don't see. Mm-hmm. But at least we get great promos out of it. And what the hell else can you ask for? A good squash match is fun. Maybe not eight of them in a row, and a, don't, not those that go ten minutes. But a good squash match is a lot of fun, and they should bring them back. Sure. 